Turn to Nehemiah 6. Nehemiah 6. Nehemiah chapter 6. I'm going to continue the Nehemiah series this morning. And uh, Nehemiah, well, it's about a, a Jew that was born in Persia. He was elevated to be the cupbearer to the king. He gets word from Jerusalem. The walls have been destroyed. And uh, so he has authority from the king to head back to Jerusalem to lead the reconstruction effort on the wall. So the last couple weeks, we've, we've seen how the enemy has attacked the progress. They've been laboring and laboring to build this wall. And uh, by the way, if, uh, if, you ha if, if this is the first time that you've, you're listening or you're watching or you've been here, all of the messages are on the website and Facebook, uh, YouTube. You forgot, we're in, we're in the world of YouTube as well. Yeah, YouTube. We're on the website, streaming on the website as well. So all of this is on, on the online. All right. So uh, we saw the enemy attack a couple weeks ago. We saw how the enemy came from the outside and they attacked with uh, discouragement and ridicule and fear. That's the form that it came on the outside. And then last week was on the inside. It was... It was the, the Jews themselves. It was the wealthy Jews. It was from within. It was selfishness and pride, and that was a hindrance. And so today, well, the attacks continue. <laughs> that old devil doesn't give up. He, he keeps on, keeps on fighting. And so this is actually going to be Nehemiah's toughest task yet, or, or toughest uh, test yet. Uh, so chapter 6, verse 1. Now it happened when Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem, the Arab, and the rest of our enemies heard that I had rebuilt the wall and that there were no breaks left in it, though at that time I had not hung the doors and the gates, that Sanballat and Geshem sent to me, saying, Come, let us meet together among the villages in the plain of Ono. But they thought to do me harm. So I sent messengers to them, saying, I am doing a great work so that I cannot come down. Why should the work cease while I leave it and go down to you? But they sent me this message four times, four times, and I answered them in the same manner which was no no did you notice when they sent the request to hang out in oh no when was it it was as the wall was built right it was sealed up all that was left were the gates were the gate one last ditch effort to, to keep nehemiah and the workers from putting the finishing touch it on it now remember, they, a couple weeks ago, you, you, you recognized Sanballat, Tobiah. They came at him hard the first time. <laughs> they hit him hard, but this time, notice they're coming in a polite manner. Very respectful, a polite invitation. Come on, let's, let's just meet at, at Ono, the plains, the plains of Ono. Ono was an oasis. Ono, you could say, was a vacation destination for the rich in those days. It was the Palm Springs. It was, oh, it was, it was a beautiful, lush place. And the enemy's like, come on, Nehemiah. Look, I, I, know, we've, I know we've dogged you <laughs> before. I know we were hard on you, but you know what? You win. You win. Let's become friends. Let's hang out together. Let's meet in Ono. And Nehemiah four times. No. 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 Oh, no. See, that's what I'm preaching. Oh, no to oh, no. You like that? Yeah. I ripped this message off from my dad, by the way, just so you, I ripped the, the title off. I remember him preaching oh, no to oh, no a co uh, back when I was a little kid. But uh, oh, no to oh, no. See, Nehemiah was on to their scheme. He knew they were trying to trick him in order to harm him so he'll stop the work. And see, what I want you to see today is, is that the strongest attack of the enemy, it wasn't an obvious attack. This, this was actually the strongest attack that, that Nehemiah would face. It wasn't an obvious attack. It was a subtle attack. It was, it was an attack on the mind, the will, the emotions. Of course, we've said it over and over again, the battles in the mind. And so today we're going to look at three mind attacks that the enemy tried against Nehemiah to keep him from finishing the wall. The first attack was through distraction and temptation. That's what this is. 
Come, let's meet at Ono. At Ono, distractions, temptation. Let's hang out. There's beautiful, you need a break. You've been working hard. There's beautiful scenery. Oh, the nightlife's great. It's party central. The women are beautiful at Ono. Come on, Nehemiah. Let's hang out. Temptations, distractions. See, the devil's a master tempter, a master distractor. And he, he distracts us and he tempts us in the areas of our greatest weakness. The areas that he, he, does, he goes after our weakness, our, our, our weak spots. In the areas that appeal to our flesh, our eyes, our pride. 1 John 2, 16, for all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is, is not of the Father, but it's of the world. Those are the three areas, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. See, for some, some people are tempted with money and power. Others, their greatest weakness is in, uh, with lust, fornication, sexual desires. Others could, could be, uh, others could be uh, bad influence, addictions, alcohol, smoking, social media, cell phones, wh whatever it is. He attacks us in the areas of our greatest weakness. But Nehemiah, he discerned the plan of the enemy, and it was oh no to oh no. You know, one of, one of the first words, well, well y'all might know this if you've got kids. What's one of the first words your little baby learned? <laughs> no. No. Of course, it's easy to say No. Everything is no, right? You remember? Everything is no. Let's go to bed. Not for bed. No. Time to change your diaper. You want to change your diaper? No. You know, you got, you got junk all in you and your diaper's hanging down to here. You want to change it? No. Okay, you comfortable with that? Okay. You know, it's just, everything is no. Share your toys with your brother. No. I mean, it's, they don't even really know. Of course, it's all selfish, 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 but it, everything is no. <laughs> yes means no to them. Are you a handsome-looking boy? No. I mean, <laughs> but see, here's what happens. So, so babies are good at saying no. <laughs> but what happens is as you, as you grow and mature and, and you develop and you, let's say you're coming into the, the, the teenage years, and things start to change and, and your hormones are going crazy and your brain is like going wacko. All, all of a sudden, we, we start saying yes to things we should be saying no to. <laughs> You're at the high school and you got all the peer pressure going on. Hey, there's a party and a bonfire down at so-and-so's down on, or, or, or down at the lake on Friday nights. You want to come? Yes. Well, yeah, parent, yeah, heck yeah, it's no. But see, yes, yes. Try this, try this beer. Everybody's drinking beer. Yes. See, we're talking about temptations. Try this joint. Oh, everybody, oh, it makes you feel good. Yes. See, we're saying, we, yes to things we should be saying no to. You become an adult. You start having kids. And parents, we're, guilt, we're guilty of, uh, of a lot of times saying yes to our kids when in reality we should be saying no a lot more, shouldn't we? Yeah, well, I, I don't want them to get mad at me. I want to be their friend. Parents, you're not, you're, you're not supposed to be their friend. Maybe you, hey, say this, say no. No. Come on, that's a liberating, that's a liberating word. No, see, see, the point is, we should be saying no to a lot of the things we're saying yes to. No, no. Devil, devil tempts us with, 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 with fornication. He tempts us with, with things on, on TV that we shouldn't watch. He tempts us in, in all these different areas. No. When the devil tempts us to get us off the wall, he tempts us to quit. He, he distracts us. No. And I mean, say it out loud. Say no. See that? It, it does something when you just say no. You're tempted. 
you're tempted to do something or look at something or, or smoke something, whatever it is you shouldn't, you shouldn't be doing. No, speak it out, no. The devil tempts you to, oh, it's a beautiful, beautiful Sunday. The, the weather's starting to get nice. Let's go out on the lake instead of coming to church with my family. No, no. Quit, yo, oh, I need to just quit. Quit your ministry. Quit your ministry. Oh, you're wasting your time. You, 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 you don't need to be up at the church that much. Quit. No. No. Ne Nehemiah discerned that, that this was all a ruse to get him off the wall through temptation and distraction. Back in the 80s, Nancy Reagan had to just say no campaign. Remember that? Just say no. You got the t-shirt to just say no. Yep, say nope to dope. Just say no. We need to resurrect that just say no campaign. But in the 21st century, it's a lot worse than it's a lot worse than, than even dope. It is say no to the devil to everything that the devil has to offer. Say no. Say no. Look at verse 5. Then, then Sambalat sent his servant to me as before the fifth time. <laughs> the fifth time. I can't, I can't tempt them. I can't get them off the wall. It's oh no to oh no. So let me go back another time. So he sends his servant the fifth time with an open letter in his hand. And it was written, it is reported among the nations. And Geshem says that you and the Jews plan to rebel. Therefore, according to these rumors, you are rebuilding the wall that you may be their king. And you, you have also appointed prophets to proclaim concerning you at Jerusalem, saying, There is a king in Judah. Now these matters will be reported to the king. So come, therefore, and let us consult together. You see what they're doing here? It's another attack at the mind. It's, it's through slander. That's the second point. We slander well, we can't get them off the wall. We can't distract them. We can't tempt them. So, let, so let's mess his name up. Let's, let, let's, let's spread lies about him. That he's in it for the wrong reasons. He, he's, not in it, he's not in it as a servant to the people. He's in it for himself. He's in it so that he can set himself up as king. Slander. Slander. See, see when you're doing something worthwhile, when you're on the wall... When you're on your assignment, when you're walking in the ways of the Lord and you're doing what you are supposed to do, there's always going to be haters. Haters going to hate. There's always going to be people out there be spreading lies, spreading rumors. Expect the slander. Expect the lies. If you're a sold-out child of God and you're on the wall doing something for the Lord, expect it, expect it. Don't be, don't be surprised. Jesus said if everybody's talking nice about you, well, then there's something wrong, <laughs> right? That's right. Yeah. Expect it, Ex expect the lies. And not just that, but the devil's so bold, he'll slander you and lie to your face. I've had the devil speak lies right to my face. Well, of course, not the literal devil himself, but those, those minds. We're talking about the mind. Those thoughts in the mind. Why are you doing this? Why are you wasting your time? This is, you're just wasting your time. Why, why are you preaching? Why are you pastoring? You're, you're, the, you're the least worthy person to pastor. All these great pastors out there, look, look at you. Wasting your time. You're unqualified, you're insignificant. I'm, have, you, have you ever had that voice lying to you? Saying, say, say, what are you doing on that wall? Liar, you're a failure. You're always going to be an addict. You're always going to be a drunk. You've, 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 never, you've never finished what you started. You always started out for the Lord, but you always fizzled out. Oh, yeah, I remember when you dedicated your life to the Lord. You was in church every day, but six months later, you're gone. That, 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 that's you, that's you. Lies, slander. But how did Nehemiah respond? Look at verse 8. Then I sent to him saying, No such things as you say are being done. In other words, he's saying, You're a liar. <laughs> You're a liar. Amen. But you invent them in your own heart. For they all were trying to make us afraid. 
intimidate us, you know. Trying to make us afraid, saying their hands will be weakened in the work and it will not be done. Oh, if I spread enough lies about him, oh, it's going to mess with him and he's going to give up and he's going to quit. His hands, he's going quit, to quit working with his hands. But then look what Nehemiah, he says, Now therefore, O God, strengthen my hands. So how did he respond? He just denied the lies and he prayed and he kept working nope it's wrong prayed to God and he kept working he kept working he didn't put out a press release to try to defend himself he didn't call a press conference to plead his case he didn't get on Facebook and write along oh they're lying about me and this and, oh and, and no that's not true he just it's a lie he prayed to God he went back to work he didn't get sidetracked. He knew what the enemy was up to. He knew they were trying to weaken him to get him off the wall. He just sought God. See, when your heart is pure and you know that you're, and, and, and you know that you're doing the right thing and you know that you've been honorable, honorable before the Lord, you don't have to get off the wall to defend yourself every time a rumor spread about you. You don't have to try to, try to defend every little lie. You know your heart. God knows your heart. One of my favorite scriptures is, is in 1 John, 1 John 1, 9, if, if we sin, but then, it, but, it, but then it says, but we have an advocate. We have an advocate. You know what that means? That means we have a lawyer to defend us. See, some of you are off the wall trying to defend yourself, disregarding the defender of the universe. Pray, seek God, and let the lawyer, that's Jesus, be your advocate. How, how many of you know that Jesus is a better defender than what you are? Amen. Christian leaders, I mean, if, if, you're a, if you're a ministry leader, pastor, man, somebody's always saying something about me. <laughs> somebody's always saying something about Pastor Troy. I bet you. I know it makes Lisa mad, you know, the, the way just, but, but they're always going, if we spend all our time trying to defend ourselves, we'd never get anything done. He looked to the Lord to be his advocate, his defender. And, and, and look what it says in, in verse 10. Because we've seen the attack of the distraction, the temptation. We've seen the attack of the slander, the lies. But then it says in verse 10, well, he's not done. The enemy's not done yet. Afterward, I came to the house of Shemaiah, the son of Deliah, the son of Medabel, who was a secret informer. Now see if you can follow this. And he said, let us meet together in the house of God within the temple. Let us close the doors of the temple, for they're coming to kill you. Indeed, at night, they will come to kill you. Now, as you're reading this, you're probably thinking, oh, here's, here's a, a prophet that's trying to help Nehemiah. He's trying to hide him out. In the house of God. Hey, the enemy's trying to kill you, Nehemiah. Come on in here. Come on in the house of God. But see, Nehemiah discerned something's not right with this. He discerned it as another lie because Shemaiah was actually paid off by the enemy. And I, and I want you to look at verse 11. Because Nehemiah, he, he said, and, and, and I said, Should such a man as I flee? And who is there such as I would go into the temple to save his life? I will not go in. Then I perceived that God had not sent him at all, but that he pronounced this prophecy against me because Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. For this reason he was hired, that I should be afraid and act that way and sin, so that they might have cause for an evil report that they might reproach me. This, this is another mind attack, and, and maybe you don't really understand what's going on here. <laughs> but, but if you really look closely at this, the sin is not just coming into the house of God. But he says, let's go within the temple. See, there's a place within the temple that only the Levitical priests were allowed to go into. The holy place, the, the most holy place. You know, it, 
it, under, under the Old Testament law, when, when the priests, the only, the only time they could go into that holy place, the priests, the only time they could go was on the Day of Atonement, one time a year. <laughs> and they would, if, if you studied some of, some of the Mosaic law, when those priests went in to offer the blood on the mercy seat, they'd tie a rope around, around their ankles and put bells on their robes so so when they walk in if they drop dead in the presence of the lord they pull them out because there's no way they're going in there to fetch the dead body of that priest if he went in there you know, un unclean and unholy so you see what you see what they're trying to do here come on in we'll protect you oh let's go into the holy place you know it's oh it sounds good see their thought is well if we can't get them will cause him to sin and compromise the law and God will judge him. Enemy's smart, isn't it? Oh, enemy's smart. But see, Nehemiah discerned this was a ploy. This was a ploy. They, they, they were, he was a hired gun. This, this was a plot to get him to compromise the law of God, the word of God, and the holy things of God. This was an attack in the form of compromise. Compromise. Let's get Nehemiah to compromise the holy things. Let's get, if, if we can get Nehemiah to compromise, God will judge him. God, God will strike him dead. But Nehemiah wouldn't compromise because his foundation was built upon the standard of the word of God, the standard of the law of God. See, as believers, we have a standard. We have a foundation. Our foundation is the word of God. We cannot compromise the word of God. We cannot compromise the holy things of God. Too many Christians... In 21st century America are compromising the standards of the Word of God. Compromise. Compromising the holy thing. Disregarding the holy things. We, we, we've forgotten that God is a holy God and we've disregarded the holy and we've compromised the standards of what God has said to save our reputation to meet our personal agenda, to get in with the in crowd. Yes, Christian leaders, Christian pastors are compromising the standard of the Word of God. It's a sad, it, it's, it's a sad thing that's going on. Compromising. See, that. There, there are standards and there are convictions. Convictions are different than standards. A conviction is something that you possess personally, whether, okay, is it a sin to do this? Is it a sin to do that? You know, it, it, technically there might not be a word that's written about it, but it's like, okay, I'm convicted about this. I'm convicted about that. Convictions change. Convictions change. My convictions have changed within the last year. I mean, th th things change. Standards don't change. See, I'm talking about standards. Standards do not change. And, and the problem is, is, is modern day Christianity, they're changing the standards to fit what, what they want, to, to, to fit the world. Is it the dumbest thing that we're allowing secular society to, call, to, to have so much influence on us where we're changing the standards of the word of God just to fit in with secular society? Is that the dumbest thing? Yes. I, I, don't, I don't know if y'all are living in the same world that I'm living in, but I see this. I see this. I, I, I know I'm just a, a little peon in Keystone Heights with, with, a, with a good little church here. I'm not a mega church pastor. I'm not, I'm not on TV. But it's a sad thing. And, and, and since 2021, I've had to turn off a lot of the pastors that I looked up to. A lot of televangelists up on there and a lot of those guys with the, with the jeans so tight 
They look like they can't even breathe and the hipsters and, and the stupid light shows and the smoke and, and, it, and it's all a performance in there. Look, if you've, got to, if you've got to put in smoke to simulate the Holy Spirit, Ichabod on you. <laughs> Ichabod on you. Because there ain't no Holy Ghost in there. <laughs> Stand up for Jesus, baby. That's it. I, I tell you, I've, 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 done, I've done a 180 just in, even in the last five or ten years. A 180. It's sad. It's sad. He, 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 the, the enemy tried to get him to compromise. But he stood upon the foundation of the Word of God. When you stand upon the foundation of the Word of God, you, you, you are, you are going to have lies spread about you. But that's our foundation. We, we, we need people who will stand up like that old song. Remember that old song, I stand alone on the Word of God? The B-I-B-L-E. You know what? How, how, many of you, how many of you refuse to compromise? Slip up your hand. Let's refuse to compromise. Let's stay on the wall. Let's take our stand, just, just like this right here. Let's take our stand for the Lord. Compromise, compromise. And, and look what he said in verse 14. My God, remember Tobiah and Sanballat according to their works and the prophetess Noadiah and the rest of the prophets who would have made me afraid in verse 15. So the wall was finished on the 25th day of Elul in 52 days. Only less than two months they had finished the work. And look at verse 16. And it happened when all our enemies heard of it and all the nations around us saw these things that they were very disheartened in their own eyes for they perceived that this work was done by our God. That's what you want it to be said of you about the work. It, 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 it's not about Morgan's house being accomplished. It's not about P. Troy and Lisa. They didn't accomplish it. It's about the Lord accomplishing. All of the minutes. It's not, it's not about my ministry. Oh, I grew a great kids ministry. I grew a great church. No, we want it to be said. Look what the Lord has done. It wasn't by the strength of man. It was by the strength of of the Lord. And here's how, I want to, here's how I want to wind down. I want you to turn to 1 Peter 5 8 because we've seen these attacks. And this is your go to verse to withstand the attacks on the mind, the, the, the attacks to, to tempt, to distract, to compromise, to try to get you off your game because of the enemy lies. 1 Peter 5 8 Be sober, be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. See, this is, this is, this is for the mind of the believer. Now, now when he says be sober, he, he, he's not pointing directly to, to wine. Don't drink wine. But he is using the analogy. He's using the analogy, being sober. To, what does wine do to your mind? Look, messes it up, lowers your... Judgment, right? Get, get your... Y'all are like this. Oh, I'm so holy. I don't even know what it, what it does to my mind because I'm so holy. I am so... <laughs> scared, scared. It does. It, it, it messes with your mind. So that's what he's using. He's using that analogy. It lowers... So, so how do we guard our mind against these attacks? Number one, be sober. Be sober. Have a clear mind. It means to have a calm, collected demeanor, to be temperate, to be in control. That's why Paul said in Ephesians 5.18, Be not drunk with wine, but be filled with the Spirit. The whole point here is that the Spirit of God needs to be in total control of our mind, our will, our emotions, our spirit, our heart. How can you be filled and under the control of the Holy Ghost if something else is in control? That's the point. Being sober, so it goes hand in hand. Being sober-minded goes hand in hand with being filled with the Spirit. A sober mind is a mind that I, I, I'm not inhibited by, by any kind of influence. I'm filled with the Spirit. It's the Spirit of God that's, that's controlling me. Being sober-minded also means having our mind renewed in the Word of God. 
We've got to have our mind renewed in the Word of God. It's impossible to be sober-minded and walk daily with a sober, calm mind. It's impossible if you're not in your Bible every day. It's impossible. You cannot be sober-minded without daily Bible study. You can't. Every day. And, 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 and to be honest with you, it, it even goes past the little one minute devote. You know, they got all these booklets out there. One minute with Jesus. One minute in the Word. One little power verse. Husbands, wives, are you going to have a good relationship with one minute with each other? Come on now. You, you got to get, well, I got to get up early. I got to get up early. You know what that means? You've got to go to bed earlier. So that way you can get up at least 15, 20, 30 minutes earlier to study the Word of God before you leave. Or you get the Word. You know, nowadays they got the Bible where you can play the Bible audibly. <laughs> you know, maybe on the way to work instead of turning on the, the morning radio, the morning drive, just get your Bible app and just play Word the whole time. See, there's ways to get the Word in you. The point is you've got to get the Word in you to be sober-minded, to be spirit-minded, the second point be vigilant so be sober be vigilant they are different these are different being sober is to be calm to be in control being vigilant means to be awake and ready to be ready finger on trigger hand on sword alert like a soldier on the wall ready ready to defend at all times and if you take those two words sober vigilant you can put them, mash them up into one word. And it's a word that Jesus gives in Matthew 26, 41. Watch. Sober, vigilant equals watch. Watch and pray, lest you enter into temptation. The spirit indeed is willing, but the flesh is weak. Be sober plus be vigilant equals be watchful. That's the, that's the math problem there on how to guard your mind. Be watchful. Being watchful is being sober-minded and being ready. And Jesus, he's saying to keep yourself from being tempted, from being distracted, from compromising. Be watchful. Be sober-minded. Be vigilant. And then he says, because your flesh is weak. You notice he said? Your flesh is weak. You got to watch and, and guard your mind because your flesh is weak. You know what that tells me? It tells me that, that, that the most important thing I need to do is watch my mind. See, 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 the temptation doesn't come against the flesh. The temptation starts in the mind. And the flesh follows the mind. So that's why we've got to guard our mind. Be, be watchful. If we don't guard our mind, we'll cave, we'll give in, we'll compromise, we'll yield to our flesh. But then Jesus says, watch and pray. And pray. Watch and pray. See, Nehemiah wasn't just watchful. But did you notice he prayed? Every single chapter, there's a prayer. Every single chapter, there's a prayer. Watch and pray. Here he says, Lord, strengthen my hands. And then he says, Lord, remember what they've done. A previous chapter, he says, last week, he says, Lord, remember me. <laughs> it's watch and pray. And I guess what I'm saying, <laughs> I guess what I'm saying is I wind it down. <laughs> There's really no magic formula <laughs> to garden your mind. There's not a magic formula. It's simply watch and pray. Be sober. Be vigilant. Be calm, temperate, in control. Be on guard. Be ready. And pray. Be in the Word. Sober-minded. And pray. Be controlled. Be filled with the Holy Spirit. Be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Remember when Jesus was getting ready to
to leave and ascend back to heaven, Acts 1.8, he says, when the Spirit comes upon... Now, he's speaking to people who are saved. He's speaking to his disciples. They were weak. They were weak. You, you could say his disciples at that moment, they were off the wall. <laughs> they were off the wall. But Jesus says, you know what? When the Holy Spirit comes, you're going to be endued with power to get back on the wall, to grow the church, to be a witness. And you know, maybe there's some people sitting in here today. You're a Christian. You know Jesus. But you've never been baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. You might know Jesus. Yeah, see, when you're saved, yeah, the Spirit comes to live within you. You're sealed with the Holy Spirit. You're on your way to heaven. But it doesn't necessarily mean you're empowered with the Spirit. You've got to seek to be empowered with the Holy Spirit, to be baptized in the Holy Spirit. Maybe there's someone in here, you haven't been in your word. How can you be sober-minded if you're not in the word? Be watchful. Be prayerful. The reason I'm saying that is because I bet you there are people that are watching and there's people in here today, you're this close from getting off the wall. You're this close. It's like you're hanging on by a thread. You're discouraged. You're frustrated. You're tempted. Your family's in disarray. Maybe you're burnt out. That close, that close to leaving your assignment. Watch and pray. Be filled with the Spirit of God. We as a church, oh, we need a fresh filling of the Holy Spirit. Fresh anointing to be endued with power. Oh, we got a wall to build, don't we? We got a wall to build. I want to ask you to bow your heads. If you're losing your zeal for the Lord, if you're losing your passion for the Lord, if you're ready to quit building, if you're tempted to leave the wall, that's a sign that you need to be filled with the Spirit and endued with power. That's what that means. If you've lost your passion, that's a sign you need to be filled with the Spirit. And that's to the believer. That's to the believer. The good news is, is Jesus said for those who, who want the Holy Spirit, just ask Him. He don't, he don't keep the, the power of the, the anointing of the Holy Spirit away from you. He'll, he'll give to you if you ask Him. Well, the anointing's just for the preacher. No, it's not. It's for every single believer. The power of the Spirit is for every single believer. If you really want God to meet you, if you really want to be filled with the Spirit, if you really want to be endued with power so that you can stay on the wall, He'll fill you with His Spirit today. And maybe there's someone listening online and in here and you've never received Jesus as your Lord and Savior. This is for the unbeliever. This is for the non-Christian right now. Today's the day that you can receive Jesus as your Lord and Savior. It's not by works of righteousness which you have done. It's according to your mercy that he has saved you. That he has saved you. Would you pray with me? If you've never received Jesus as Lord and Savior, will you pray with me? Say, Jesus, I believe that you died on the cross for me. Jesus, I believe that you shed your blood for me. Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I know that I'm needy of salvation. Please save me. I receive your grace. Come on, you can have assurance today knowing that Jesus is your Lord and Savior. You're not joining a country club. You're not joining a, a legalistic society. You're just coming into the family of God, admitting you're a sinner and asking Jesus to save you. And now, Father, I pray, Lord, that as we come into this time of response, I pray, Lord, that you would please have your way. I pray that we would respond to you. I pray that, that you would fill us with the power of your spirit so that we would guard our minds, so that we would stay on the wall and finish our assignment. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, please move now, Lord. In